Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Glad to have all of you here. Welcome uh, to those who are online watching either as we do it or some might catch it a little later. We're glad to have you watch uh, and join us in our study this morning. Uh, we will begin as we usually do with a couple of our young people to share their scripture with us. So who's first? Okay, go ahead, <laughs> Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Philippians 2, verses 3 to 4. I like this first because it reminds me to act in humility without becoming too full of myself. I see in this verse that I should serve others before myself, just like Jesus would have done. Please fold your hands, bow your heads, and join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, please help us to remember that in the grand scheme of things, we should put our peers above ourselves. We ask that you give us humble hearts that are always ready to continuously serve you. In your name we pray. Amen. First Chronicles 16 verse 11 says, Look to the Lord in his strength. Seek his face always. I like this verse because it tells me that God will always help me and be at my side. I see in this verse that no matter what happens to me, the Lord will always be here for me. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for always being with us. Please help us to trust in your strength more and to trust that you will always be with us. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. Okay, Carla, you are around here someplace. Where are you? There you are. I don't know. Go for it. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I've scheduled another lunch assembly for the Milwaukee Rescue Mission on uh, March 18th. That'll be the last one we have until this fall. And uh, as usual, all donations need to be in the kitchen on Sunday, March 17th. And also, and just as important, volunteers to make those lunches. Uh, I, on behalf of the rescue mission and myself, I wanna thank you for your continued support and help with this mission. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Carla. Oh, you're welcome. I want to turn that off. There we go. All right. Okay. Uh, we will share some of our uh, things that other people from the class have shared with us. This is a uh, well, it's a, I know it's a chore, but we have to get the tree down by this weekend. That's for those of you who still have Christmas stuff up. Not to mention any names, but. <laughs> All right. On our way to church, we asked her grandchild why it's important to be quiet in church. She said, because people are sleeping there. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes. And finally, I found marriage to be a very educational. For example, I had no idea there was a wrong way to put milk in the fridge. <laughs> this is for guys. You don't know that. When you grow up by yourself, you know, or you're on your own, doesn't matter, but all of a sudden it does. I don't know why that is, but okay, whatever. Um, let me get my uh, recorder out here, and we'll uh, we will begin. <laughs> all right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the day. Thank you for letting us gather here as we continue our study of the story of Jesus given to us through your servant, Matthew. May you bless us with your spirit and guide us as we seek to understand and to grow in faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we are in the 26th chapter of the Gospel of St. Matthew. We're going to start at verse 29, which is the uh, end of, a, of the story. Um, and we're going to pick it up at right at the end of the of the Lord's Supper. Jesus is just finishing up. He has um, given his uh, disciples uh, the sacrament, 
and um, we didn't quite finish this last week, so I'm going to pick it up at verse 40, 29, where he simply says, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Uh, what he is really he's starting a whole new era what when he gives the him them his body and blood he is going back to jeremiah when he says there'll be a new covenant and he's starting that now and so you you get away from that little one sentence that a he wants us to do this again and we are con and the, the christian community if there's anything that has marked the christian church down through the centuries it's the celebration of the lord's supper now, there may be of different understandings in different ways, but it's been part of it. We see it surface in 1 Corinthians. The Corinthian congregation uh, was celebrating it. They had it kind of screwed up, and Paul has to straighten them out in 1 Corinthians. But they were doing it. And down through the years, that's been one of the marks of the church, is the celebration of the Lord's Supper. And so Jesus urges them to continue to do that, but he says, I'm not going to be, be there physically, although he is. He is there as uh, his body and his blood is shared, but he won't be there. He won't drink this with him again until when he drinks it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So there is a day coming. And we, we talk about it in our liturgy of the sacrament. This is a foretaste of the feast to come. Uh, and so every time we receive the body and blood of Jesus, it's a, it's a hint of this wonderful banquet that's, that's awaiting us in his kingdom. Uh, so um, then it tells us that um, when they had sung a hymn, verse uh, 30, uh, they went out to the Mount of Olives. They had, uh, when they had sung a hymn, uh, there are a number of psalms. They're called Hillel psalms or praise psalms. Uh, in in uh, that are specifically designed for use at the end of Passover. Psalms 115 to 118 are those Passover psalms. Uh, and any time the Passover is celebrated, one or more of those psalms is usually spoken or sung. The psalms, after all, were songs. Um, every once in a while, one of the headings of a psalm would be to the tune of, you know. Well, we don't know what the tunes were anymore, but... Um, they were they would be sung and so that's how they ended their meal now we're going to read uh, from verse 31 uh, to what is it 35 31 to 35 as they were going from the upper room to the Mount of Olives this happens go ahead then Jesus told them this very night you will all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. Okay. They're leaving from the Mount of Olives. They've got a, a couple, couple mile walk down through the Kid, Kidron Valley up to the Mount of Olives. I'll show you some pictures in just a minute about that. But on the way, Jesus makes this announcement that uh, they're going to all... Uh, fall away. The, the Greek word really means stumble. Uh, they're going to stumble along the way. Um, and um, the, actually, the Greek word is skandalon, which is where we get our word scandal. Uh, this is scandalous behavior. They're going to not just, uh, you know, hide. They're going to actually, they're going to stumble. They're going to uh, pretend that they're not part of this at all which is exactly what happens. But of course, Peter, uh, uh, be, and then he says, you will fall, well, fall away, you will stumble, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Uh, he quotes um, uh, uh, Zechariah 13, verse 7, um, as Jesus almost always does. He doesn't ever just say something. He always is quoting the Old Testament. And here he quotes Zechariah 13, uh, where he says they will, uh, the sheep will be scattered. Uh, and that's exactly what happens. 
But Peter, Peter in his boldness, you got to love Peter. Uh, he's, he's compulsive, if nothing else. And he hears Jesus say, you're going to stumble, and he goes, oh, no, not me. I'll never do that. I'll never fall away. I'll never deny you. And Jesus says, he, I think Jesus almost chuckled, uh, <laughs> except for the seriousness of, of what's coming up. But Jesus says, oh, no, Peter, uh, I know you. I know your intentions. I know you mean well. Um, but you're not you're going to stumble not just once uh, but three times uh, and before the rooster crows you will deny me three times and Peter said even if I must die with you I will not deny you and those words came back to haunt him within a few hours so before the rooster crows just a side comment and we've mentioned this before about the rooster uh, the Talmud insists, Josephus agrees, that there were no chickens in Jerusalem, especially at Passover time. Uh, and so how does a rooster crow if there are no chickens to do that? Uh, there's no roosters around, as we would not describe a rooster. Well, the word, he never uses the word chicken. He uses the word rooster or, or cock. Uh, to describe um, what really is a phenomenon that happened every morning. There was a Jewish priest that would unlock the temple at daybreak, and he would call the people to prayer. If you've ever been to Muslim communities where they have the, the, the tower and the, the loudspeaker of the, them chanting, calling people to prayer, well, that's the same idea. Uh, there was a priest that would, from the temple area, he would call out in a very loud voice, inviting the people to come to prayer. That was, and he, and he was called the rooster. That's what they called him. And so it, it's pretty much agreed that's who Jesus is referring to. Not some chicken, but rather the priest. So when Peter, and they're not far from the temple. I showed you a picture last week of the temple of the, of the Jerusalem area, and it, it's not that far. You're a few hundred yards from where the temple is, where Caiaphas' house is. And so Peter would have heard this priest calling in the morning people to prayer. And that was what he heard. That's what Jesus says. You're going to hear that call to prayer, that rooster. When you'd before, and you're going to hear that. By the time you hear that, you will have denied me three times. And we'll just put that in abeyance until we get a little bit farther uh, in the chapter uh, when it actually occurs. Okay? So that's on the way. Now let me give you just a, a I just dug out from my slides of, of, of trips to Jerusalem some pictures. This is from Mount Scopus, which is to the north of Jerusalem. There's the Temple Mount over there. You see that dome? That's the Dome of the Rock. This over here is the Mount of Olives. You can see it's higher in elevation. So if you're up here, you can look down on the whole temple area. And that's what G Peter saw uh, earlier in Holy Week when they went up on the Mount of Olives. They, they looked back and, and they said, wow, isn't that a beautiful sight? And Jesus says, yeah, but it's going to all be destroyed. And it was. This is the Kidron Valley right through here. So they were, they're up here for the upper room and they would come down through the Kidron Valley and back up along here in this general area is where the Garden of Gethsemane is. Uh, so that's the, the topology, that, that's the hills of Judea in the back. Uh, so they're going to leave here, go down through the valley, and up here. Now, um, I'm going to take you up. I'm going to back up here. I'm going to take you up. You can't, you can just barely see it. There's a tower right over there. That's the Church of Our Redeemer. Um, and we're going to go climb that tower, and I'm going to look back over the, the area. Now we're looking to the east uh, from, the, from Redeemer Tower, and there's the, temp, there's the temple grounds, that area there where the Dome of the Rock now sits, but that was where the temple stood. <laughs> then the Kidron Valley is below it, and then up onto the Mount of Olives. Uh, I'll back up. You remember this tower right here? Okay? That's this same tower right there. 
So this is the Mount of Olives. The Gethsemane is right down in this region down here. So I'll take you through. Now, standing, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move from the tower and I'm gonna go stand right along the wall here, looking to the east. That's this big view. We're right along in the Temple Mount right behind us. We're looking to the east across the Kidron Valley and there's Gethsemane. Now, naturally, all the sites of Jesus that are in the Holy Land have a church built on top of it. And so the Church of All Nations is built right where the garden is. The garden is right here. At least that's where they say it is right now. But this is the general area where the Garden of Gethsemane would have been. Now, we're gonna, I'm going to take you to this building. You see that right there? We're going to go stand right next to that building. That's this building right here. Okay, you follow with me? Are you keeping the perspective? This is the Church of All Nations that we just looked at. This is the side of it. And this down here is what they refer to. They, they take you, if you want to go to the Garden of Gethsemane, this is where they will take you. And so in that garden are olive trees. Gethsemane means olive grove or where olives are processed or where olives drip. That's what Gethsemane means. So there's an ancient olive tree here. Olive trees don't die, they just get fat uh, and keep growing. So this olive tree is, is really old, centuries old. Um, and Jerusalem, you can't see it, but Jerusalem is, is, is over here. Um, so now we're going to go into the Church of All Nations. This is the interior of it. This is the altar area. There is a uh, mosaic of Jesus kneeling at a stone uh, with the angels looking over and down here in front of the altar is that stone that's why the church was built here because it's built over this stone I'm sorry the color this is a copy of a, of a slide and it didn't copy as, as well as I like so the colors are kind of washed out but that's a stone there and there's this fence around it and a crown of thorn type fence uh, but that's the stone, according to tradition, where Jesus prayed. Now, that's, I'm, I'm underlying and putting in parentheses according to tradition because none of the Gospels, all they all, although they all talk about Gethsemane, none of them talk about a stone. They just that Jesus fell down and prayed. So, okay. The important thing is you're in the vicinity. You're within uh, a few hundred feet of where it actually happened. So you're in the, in the region. Okay, so that's, that's Gethsemane. Um, like I say, it's an, it's an irony that Gethsemane means where olive trees or olives are squeezed and drip, and what does Jesus do? He's dripping, according to Luke's account, drops of blood. So a lot of irony, a lot of parallel in this whole story. Uh, so uh, why don't you read the account of Jesus in, in Gethsemane from uh, 30, what is it, 36 down to 46. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away for a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hand of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Okay. 
Jesus went with them, pronoun. Who's the them? Probably, undoubtedly, it's just Jesus and the 11. Judas is not there, not with them right now. He'll, he'll be there later. later. Uh, but they go to this place called Gethsemane. Uh, it appears to be, although we have no specific record, it appears to be a favorite place of Jesus. It's a quiet place. Uh, it's on the lower slopes of the Mount of Olives, and it's a place for him to gather and a place to go and pray. And that's what he intends to do. Um, he uh, takes, he has, he tells the disciples to just uh, watch, uh, just, uh, just sit here while I go over and pray. He doesn't ask them to pray, which is interesting. He just tells them, stay here. Well, they do. And then he goes a little bit farther and takes Peter and the two sons of Zebedee um, and began to be sorrowful and troubled. Now, I, whether there was physical evidence of that, we don't know, but he's, he's extremely struggling. And he tells Peter and James and John, uh, and my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Uh, remain here and watch with me. Again, he doesn't ask them to pray, just ask them to stay awake and watch with him. And then going farther, he fell on his face and he prayed, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, as I will, but as you will. Jesus is struggling, deeply, deeply struggling over what's about to come. Um, and there is uh, there is simply no way that you and I can get inside of what he would be experiencing. It's one thing to know that you are about to be nailed to a piece of wood. He knows that's coming. He said so. That in and of itself is enough to just cause tremendous anguish. But then added to that, he knows that he's taking upon himself the sinfulness of the world and that his close, intimate relationship with God, his Father, is going to be torn asunder. He's going to be ripped away from God. And that anguish is just impossible to us to understand. And so it's really not surprising that he offers a prayer. It's a two-part prayer. Um, and he still addresses God as Father. It's interesting, that changes when he's on the cross, but here he still calls him Father. If possible, he said, let this cup pass from me. You get a glimpse into the human nature of Jesus. Simply put, he doesn't want to do this. I don't know anybody who would volunteer and say, yeah, I'd like to do that. Now, I want you to picture in your mind Jesus in this garden struggling to do the will of God and put that alongside Adam and Eve in a garden struggling to do the will of God. We know from the first Adam that they didn't do it God's way. <coughs> they did it their way. Jesus, on the other hand, is kneeling there praying, God help me do it your way. Because he says, I really don't want to do this, but, but, not my will, but as you will. That's a huge shift there. He's struggling with it, but he, he commits himself to doing it the way. He knows that God's not going to go, oh, okay, yeah, let's, let's, let's find a different route. He knows that's not going to happen, but he still has to say it. And adds, but not my will, but yours be done. Um, it's, a, it's a model for prayer. There are things that you and I know we want, and we know that God doesn't maybe want us to have them. Is it okay to go to God and say, God, I really, really want this? Yes. Throw it all in front of him, but then add, but it's got to be your will. It's got to be your way, not mine. 
But that struggle in front of God, that struggle uh, with with God is is normal and natural, and Jesus models that for us. It's okay to struggle with God. You're not showing some lack of faith when the reality of our human nature comes front comes face to face with the will of God. I don't want to do this, but I'll do it according to your will. I mean, that's that's the heart of of what His prayer is all about. Uh, and so as Jesus in a garden agrees to do the Father's will, Adam and Eve in a garden don't. And that's why he's there. That's why he's there in this garden, because Adam and Eve failed and brought sin into the world. Now he's dealing on all of that sin, now becomes heaped on him. Um, let this cup pass from me. It's interesting that he uses the word cup. Uh, I want to take you to uh, Isaiah 51 um, verse 17 and, and it may be very well that he had this passage in mind when he chose that word for the cup that he has to drink. Isaiah 51 uh, verse uh, 17 says, Wake yourself, wake yourself, stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, who have drunk to the dregs the bowl, the cup of staggering. That's the cup. The cup of God's wrath. Isaiah 51, 17, if you're trying to find that verse. Uh, if, you, if you, you know, if we've dealt with that, that... That's the, and that's the word he uses. So cup, he talked in, in the Lord's Supper. He says, here's the cup. This is my blood. And he calls it a cup. Takes this, take this cup. And now he talks about the cup of the wrath of God that he has to drink. He's got to drink it down fully. Um, and, and, and throughout the Old Testament, cup, I could, I could give you numerous other references of the cup being the wrath of God. Uh, and Jesus is, is connecting to those. He's not refusing. He's not saying, I won't do this. He's saying, I don't want to do this. But as you will, I, I'll do that. Um, when, um, uh, what's his name? Um, um, the, the Passion of the Christ, that movie. Uh, Mel Gibson. Mel Gibson did that movie. Do you remember the opening scene? Where was the opening scene? It was in the garden. And who was there with Jesus? Satan was there. And it's a fascinating understanding of it because this is where Satan is right now. That's what Jesus is dealing with. At the end of his temptation in Luke's gospel, it said Satan left him for a more opportune time. Here we are. Here we are. This is his battle with Satan. Satan wants, Adam and Eve's battle was with Satan. Satan won that battle. Satan does not want Jesus to go to the cross. And he's putting everything into that to try and convince Jesus he doesn't need to do this. And that's an easy temptation. From a human standpoint, nobody wants to go to a cross. That's the struggle. Satan is tempting him. But then he says, but it's not my will that counts. It's the Father's will. And I'm spending some time on this because I want you to understand the struggle. This was not a simple prayer. We don't know how long he did this. See, Jesus says to his disciples, couldn't you watch with me for an hour? You probably, at least that. So this is not a simple two-sentence prayer. Okay, now we're done. Now let's move on. This is a real deep struggle. Um, and then after praying, uh, and I put in parentheses for an hour, I don't know how long, Jesus comes back and finds his disciples sleeping. Um, yeah, probably. It's late at night. It's 11 o'clock at night, somewhere in there, midnight. Uh, they just had a full meal. Um, 
they get sleepy. I know I would. <laughs> and that's also an indication that they don't yet understand what's going on. They don't really grasp what's about to happen. Jesus has told them he's going to be betrayed. He's told them that he's going to be handed over. But they don't understand. Here in the quiet of this garden, uh, they don't understand what's, what's about to fall upon them. And so they take a nap. Uh, and Jesus... Um, he says to Peter, could you not watch with me an hour? Watch, and here he asks them to pray. But notice this, pray that you may not enter into temptation. He doesn't ask them to pray for him. He asks them to pray for themselves. And what's the temptation? The temptation is that they will fall away. He's already told them that. Pray that you have the strength that you don't fall away. Uh, he wants them to pray that it doesn't happen. And then he, he says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Um, and that describes us, too. There are so many times when, yeah, that's what I want to do, but, oh, man, I just don't get it done. I just don't do it. Uh, my spirit, yeah, I really want to. Paul, we, in, my, in our early morning Bible class, we looked at Romans 7. Uh, and the good that I would, I do not. The evil I would not, that's what I do. Well, that's what this is. You know, we may be very willing, we may want to do it this way, but the reality is sin takes over and we fail time and time again. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And flesh, by the way, is Paul's favorite word for our sinful nature. That's what he calls it, our flesh. So for a second time, he goes away and prays, uh, saying uh, the same words, again comes back, finds them sleeping, um, and... Uh, for their, and Matthew adds the phrase uh, in verse uh, 43, well, their eyes were heavy. Yeah, probably. Matthew is almost kind of, kind of excusing them, because remember, he's part of the other group that's sleeping too. And he's almost kind of excusing them while they were, their eyes were heavy. Yeah, they were. Uh, but they didn't watch. And leaving them, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. And the fact that he does it three times is evidence again of the struggle that he's going through and uh, that he's seeking God's help. Luke tells us that angels came and ministered to him. Luke also tells us that, he sweat, that his sweat became like drops of blood. And I know there is a medical, physical condition where that can happen, where you can get so tense, so uh, in such struggle that, you, that, that, that your, your forehead will, will start to, to bleed. Uh, it, it, it happens. Um, but then there is a, a, a decided shift at the end of this. Matthew doesn't say it in so many words, but there's a definite shift in the demeanor of Jesus. He's been on his knees. He's been struggling. And then verse 48, then he comes to them and says, sleep and take your rest later on. The hour is at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. All of a sudden, it's, it's like Jesus has come to the end of his struggle. We're done with this now. Let's do it. It's kind of like when you, you, you know you've got a task that you've got to do, you really don't want to do it, and you struggle with it, and finally you go, all right, let's just do it. And that's kind of the way I see Jesus. Let's just get this done. Because from here on, things are seemingly out of his control, although they're never out of his control. But let's just get this done. And so he wakes the disciples and said, you can sleep later. Right now, we need to be alert. We need to pay attention. He said, rise, let us be going. We're not told where he was going other than uh, going out to the edge of the garden to meet his betrayer who is at hand. I'm going to stop and see whether you have any comments or questions on this, on the prayers of Jesus in Gethsemane. Anybody? Yes, in the back. So. I have friends that are Christian or struggling Christians, and they just pray in the Saturdays, but they always bring up, how can Jesus be praying to himself? Right. What, you know, how can Jesus pray for himself? To himself. To himself. To, him, to himself, right? Uh, here's where we, probably where we get the, the closest picture 
of the mystery of the dual nature of Christ. He is both fully God and fully human. Uh, he's not partially human. He's not partially, you know, this. and he isn't mostly God, but once in a while he, he, you know, he eats and sleeps. You know, he's, he's, he's a human being just like us. And if you were in that situation, who would you pray for? <laughs> you know, I'd be struggling. God help me. Uh, and this is his human nature. You can see it shy, you know, Just as we saw his divine nature on the Mount of Transfiguration, here we see his human nature. And there is no way that we can mentally or even, uh, in, even uh, begin to understand how that works. We can't divide the two. There isn't part-time he's God and part-time he's human. It's like that. But as Hebrews says, Jesus was like us in every respect except one. He didn't sin. And so he didn't give in to that. He said no. So, But and Jesus in the garden, that's, that's the human nature uh, as clearly as it could be. You bet he's going to pray for himself. He's, gonna, he's facing a cross. Is that... Is that? <laughs> and I say it's something you maybe don't understand, but you have to believe that they don't like to hear that. Well, of course not. We we want answers. We want to have everything figured out. We are rationalists for crying out loud. Let's let's get everything in get all of our ducks in a row. Uh, and they don't like it when two or three ducks are missing. Uh, <laughs> um, there, yeah, the Trinity, the divine nature of Jesus, uh, the divine human nature, the uh, dual nature. Those are beyond, totally beyond our compensation, uh, our, our um, understanding. Admittedly, yes, Roger. I think the Athanasian Creed is probably the best thing that uh, yeah. even talk about with that. Right. Yeah, the Athanasian Creed struggles with the Trinity more than any of the other creeds, but it goes on and on and on and on about, you know, not, not two, but not, not three gods, but one, not three persons, but one, you know. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Yes. How do we know the word that it did because he went off by himself? How do we know that those were the words he was praying? As Paul says, men uh, wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Uh, Matthew was given the words from God. Um, and we don't know that how far away they were. You know, Peter, James, and John could very well have heard what he said and told Matthew. But uh, the Holy Spirit's in charge of this. And what we have in Scripture is what he wants us to have. And so, yeah, we can be pretty confident that's what he said. Good question, though. You know, as my brother would always tell me, if you're going to eavesdrop, listen. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Barb. This is probably a little on base, but why were Peter, James, and John his favorite disciples? Um, that's a good question. Um, for whatever reason, they were the first three always mentioned. Anytime you read a list of the uh, of the disciples in in the Gospels, those three are mentioned first: Peter, James, John, always. And they were the ones that seemed he took them up on Mount Transfiguration. He takes them with him here. I don't know why, but they were. Uh, they were his favorite. Um, okay, that it? All right, let's, um, let's read on where Jesus is betrayed. Now Judas comes on the scene. Why don't you read 47 down to uh, 56. While they were still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Friend, do what you came for. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of the Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. 
Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? At that time, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Okay. The plans of the chief priests and and then Judas included, you know, were there, and now we have the plans of of Jesus and, and God's plan, and they kind of clash right now. So what's Judas been doing um, from the time he left the upper room, and we don't know exactly when he led, but left, but he did leave, until now he shows up at the garden. Well, he had arranged with the, we know he had arranged with the, the chief priest that he would betray Jesus, and he was given a sum of money, but he, there were no specifics at that point because he didn't know how he was going to do this. Well, as things played out, as he left there that night, he knew where they were going, either because somebody had said that, Jesus had said, or because he knew that's where they like to go after something like this. And so he knew where they would be. And so it clicked in his mind, okay, this is my chance. And so he went to the chief priest. Now, it's interesting, they had said they wanted to arrest Jesus, no question about that, but to do it after the feast. So like Monday or so, or maybe even the whole week, uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, maybe even after that whole period, they wanted to do this. But now the opportunity presents itself, and so they go ahead. They, know, they, they go ahead now because uh, they know that uh, they could arrest Jesus right now. It would be done in the dark. It would be away from the crowds. Uh, and so we can make it happen. And so he goes back to them and he says, let's go. We can do this right now. And so they pull together, a, and it's called a crowd, probably some of the temple guard. Uh, they were armed. They had swords and clubs. We don't know, but it, I think it's an ironic picture of this crowd of, of, of guards. They, they have swords and clubs, and they're going out into the Gethsemane to arrest what? <laughs> Jesus and his band of, of 11 followers, the rest 12 people, they don't have anything, they don't have any way of defending themselves, although we know that they had one sword. Um, that's it. You know, it's, it's a bit of overkill, but be that as it may. But here's the two plans being carried out, but God's plan supersedes. They didn't want to do it during the feast. God says, oh yeah, you're going to do it now. Okay, let's do it. Uh, Judas and the crowd seem to be in control, but they're not in control. Jesus makes that very clear. You're not in control of this. But this is going to happen because that's the way scriptures say it needs to happen. And so it plays out according to God's plan. Um, the arrangement, the plan was, the hastily put together plan, was for Judas to identify Jesus with a kiss. Now, there is, of course, a, a, a subtle irony in, in, the, in, Jesus, in Judas pretending to be a friend and, and greeting Jesus with a kiss. That's not an abnormal greeting, by the way, especially in that culture, to greet someone with a kiss on the cheek. That's fairly normal. But why would Judas do that? Well, you have to understand, uh, all, of the, all of you who wear glasses, take your glasses off. <laughs> now we're going to turn off all the lights. Now find somebody that you're not really sure who they look, what they look like. Why? Well, you can't do that. And they want to make sure they don't mess it up. They want to make sure they get the right person. And so that's the best way to get the right person. Because what's the other thing that, that happens when you get that close to someone? Think of the five senses. You not only see, you not only hear them, you not only touch them, you're not going to taste them because you're not going to eat them. What's the other one? You smell them. People carried body odor a whole lot more than we do now. We put our right guard on and we try and cover it all up. They didn't have a right guard then. 
And so every person had a distinct smell. And, and that was another way of identifying. I make sure I got the right guy. We don't know whether Judas needed glasses either. So, <laughs> um, so he finds the right guy by doing this. But it's interesting, he greets him with the word rabbi. He doesn't call him Lord. He doesn't call him master. He calls him rabbi, teacher, which is a kind of a nondescript term. And Jesus calls him friend. Really. Ironically, sincerely, was Jesus trying to push Judas into realize what he was doing? We don't know. But I'm sure that it was as if Jesus had slapped him when he calls him friend. Because Judas knows what he's doing. And Judas also knows, remember the scene in the upper room, Judas also knows that Jesus knows what he's doing. Friend. Um, and without comment, the group seizes Jesus. Scene shifts to one of the disciples. John identifies it as Peter, who has a sword. Luke tells us that they, they said that they had actually two swords when they left the upper room, and Jesus said, that's fine, that's good. Um, we know that uh, we can be fairly certain that none of these disciples were trained swordsmen. A sword is something that you don't just whip around. You've got to learn how to use this thing. And this guy doesn't know how to use it, so because he, he hacks at one of the, the uh, crowd, and he cuts off the ear of the servant. We know his name was Malchus from John. We know that Jesus healed him, although John's the only one that tells us that. Uh, he wasn't aiming at his ear. <laughs> I'm sure he was trying to inflict a more, more debilitating wound than that, but that's what he got. It was the servant of the high priest. This is not some lowly funky. This is a, a fairly higher up in the group. Probably one of the, one of the sergeants or, or, you know, in a crowd uh, of soldiers. Uh, but uh, he, he strikes the high priest, and you know, I'm sure there was this immediate silence as they did that. And the, the crowds, the soldiers would have grabbed their swords a little tighter. Are we going to have a sword fight here? And Jesus intervenes quickly and says, no, no, put it away. This is not part of the plan. You're interrupting the plan, the plan of God. Because he says, no, put your sword away. Um, do you know, don't you? <laughs> and Jesus, he does, Jesus does a reality check with, with the disciples. And then he does a reality check with the crowd. With the, with the disciples, he says, come on. Don't you know I could have legions of angels at, at a moment if I needed them, if I wanted to fight this? We could fight this real easy. And your one sword is not going to make any difference. So we can fight this. Uh, but it only results in death. And he says, um, put your sword away because all who take the sword will perish by the sword. That sentence has gotten more scrutiny than anything. It has been used to justify violence. Well, if you, if you take a sword against me, I can take a sword against you. It's been used to justify capital punishment. If you take the sword, you get to you know, you perish by the sword. All Jesus, he's kind of quoting a proverb, and he's just simply saying the statement of reality. <laughs> Violence will be met with violence. That's just simply reality. If you don't think that's true, go and hit somebody once. And you're going to get violence back. It's just the way it is. I'm not saying you should go hit somebody. <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. Uh, better, better is to, you know, forgive them and be nice to them. But Jesus is simply saying, no, this isn't going to work. I've got a plan. It's in, it's in place. We could get legions of angels, but if, how then should the scripture be fulfilled that it must be so? This is the plan, Peter, or disciples. Let's just let the plan play out. Because God's in control. That's the point. He could bring down legions of angels, but he's not going to because this is God's plan. This is not Judas' plan. This is not the chief priest's plan. This is God's plan. And we need to let it play out. And then he turns and does a reality check with the crowds. 
um, he speaks to the crowd and he says think about this for a minute guys are you really realize what you're doing you come out here with these swords and clubs I've been sitting among the with you at the temple for days I've been teaching you didn't arrest me then but notice what he says this is part of God's plan all of this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled and the disciples left him and fled so what he, he's reminding them he does it with the disciples he does it with the crowds you think you're running this show <laughs> you're not running this show this is God's plan and we're just going to all take part in it God has got it figured out he's got a plan you know you, you could have done this any day of the week but no, it had to be now. It had to be this way because this was God's plan. And that's, that's his simple message. Just a reality check with the, with the, with the uh, crowd, the soldiers, whatever where they were. Yes? I saw years and years ago, but when the year was chopped off, Jesus came and put it back on. Right. And that was then in John. That's in John's gospel, John's yes, right. His way of healing. Right. So no, you didn't just, yeah, no, that, that, that's depicted, and that's true. John tells a story. Matthew doesn't, Mark doesn't, Luke doesn't, but John does. He tells that Jesus healed the servant's name. Um, and, he, and it's interesting that the name is mentioned, and there's only one reason for, for John to mention the name, and that is he probably became a believer later on. He became one of the group. That's why he would mention his name. That's why Simon of Cyrene is mentioned. We're getting ahead of the story. That's why his name is mentioned. He becomes one of the group. Um, yes? You know, in Scripture, we're told a couple times when Satan was on Jesus. Case. Right. And I often wondered, you know, when Jesus said, don't you think I could call on my father and he'd send me legions of yeah. angels? I can just imagine Satan hitting him saying, you can call an angel. Yeah, Jesus. sure. Can call, on, call on your father. He'll send you an angel. Yeah, right. I mean, I, we've seen a couple of instances in Scripture, mm -hmm. but his whole life had to be challenged by Satan continually. Continually. Continually, yeah. yeah and that's, Do this, yeah. And, and I don't understand. We never will fully understand no. his human God you know, position. Yeah. Um, he had to be attacked. All the time. Right. Well, you know, that's and again. We are. Yeah, and again, you know, I, it, it's it's a very serious situation. I don't mean to minimize the seriousness of it, but there is a many times where I'm I'm sure that Jesus is kind of chuckling to himself. You know, these guys come with their swords and clubs, and you know, oh, come on, <laughs> that's what you got. What you have? Do you realize what I could do to you right now? And I think it's part of the temptation. Yes. And but no, no, this is the plan. We're going to carry out the plan. And and so you got these these two plans. You got you have you have the the chief priests and their plan of arresting Jesus and putting him to death, and you have God's plan. And those two are coming together. But never once believe that this is that God's plan is not the one that supersedes. That's the one that's being carried out always. Um, now you need to put. A, a picture behind this as you talk about the plan and and we'll, we'll talk more about this when we get to the to the uh, uh, trial and to the crucifixion of Jesus but I told you the Old Testament story of Adam and Eve in the garden and how they failed and Jesus doesn't the other Old Testament story that's a mirror of this is Abraham and Isaac as Abram takes his son up to this very same place and almost sacrifices him. Now just hold that in abeyance. Just keep that as a backdrop. And if you have some time, go back and read Genesis 22 again. Just read that story. And, and so we can keep that as a backdrop to this whole thing. Because it's, it's, um, this is what's being played out, only there's a different outcome. Because God's, remember, God's in control. This is God's plan. Um, so we'll, 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 we'll refer back to that. I don't want to get too far ahead of the story. Uh, and so John, uh, John, uh, Matthew tells us that just as Jesus had predicted, the disciples all left him 
and fled. Um, they ran off. They just, they're done. They're gone. Uh, so much for their vows. Of, and they just earlier had said, uh, Peter says, I will not deny you, uh, even if I must die with you, I'll not deny you. And it says, all the disciples said the same. Well, how long did that last? You know, for an hour or so. Um, they're going to be there. Yeah, right. Okay. And off they run. They thought their lives were at stake. And they believed that throughout the whole weekend. The disciples believed that their lives were threatened. That's why they hid in the upper room. They believed their lives were at stake. Their leader had been arrested. When, when are they next? So, and then we get a little glimpse into what happens with Peter during the trial. We'll get to that, we'll get to that next week. Uh, so any other comments or questions? Okay, uh, the story really gets uh, really gets good uh, from here on through the end of the chapter, uh, the end of the of the book, uh, as we walk with Jesus, um, following God's plan, but seeing Jesus go to a cross. Okay, let's pray. Good and gracious God, we thank you for uh, constantly showing your love to us in so many ways. There are so many times when we know we ought to do your will and we fail. There's so many times when we just simply uh, let you down and let ourselves down, knowing we don't want to do that. But your love is always there. Your forgiveness is always there. As Paul reminds us, there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And so we know that you continually pick us up and you continually forgive us and you continually uh, equip us to serve you. So bless us today so that we can be blessings to others and serve you in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, have a great week. We'll see you next week.